Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. Has the Prime Minister's statement about the India-China situation made on Friday evening confused the situation, suggesting perhaps that India's position is not as strong as we believe and perhaps corroborating the Chinese version? Or is that a mischievous interpretation? That's the key issue I shall discuss today with India's former ambassador to China and former Foreign Secretary Nirupama Rao. Mrs. Rao, let's start with what the Prime Minister said on Friday night on television. His precise words were, Na koi waha hamari seema mein ghus aya hai aur nahi koi ghusa hua hai. Would you accept translated in English? That means neither has anyone intruded across our border nor is anyone intruding. Well, Karan, I know that the statement uh, engendered a lot of speculation and there was consternation in some quarters, especially among retired army personnel, that uh, somehow the sacrifice and the martyrdom of those uh, 20 soldiers was being downplayed uh, somehow. And the prime minister was saying that there had been no intrusion to begin with or end with. Subsequently, the Prime Minister's office issued a clarification and I had all along felt that perhaps the Prime Minister had a design in mind when he made that statement and that he was basically pointing to the present situation in the Galwan uh, Valley area where both sides had cleared out and there was nobody present. In effect, some kind of disengagement had happened. And of course, then he pointed to the sacrifice of the soldiers and the fact that anybody who try, tries to threaten Mother India will get a fitting rejoinder. So that's how I read the statement and the PMO statement issued uh, the next day, in fact, seemed to somehow conform uh, to my surmise, as it were. Can I interrupt? The PMO statement issued the next day actually only spoke of half of what the PM had said. The first half was very cleverly edited out by the PMO. It's that first half that I'm referring to. And let me read it again. Na koi waha hamari seema mein ghus aya hai. The PMO left that out completely. Now that's the critical bit. On Friday night when he said it, would you accept translated into English? That means no one has intruded across our border. It's really up to the Prime Minister to clarify uh, what he had to say. So I really don't want to wade into what is and what has transpired and turned out to be quite a minefield. Uh, but the fact is the PMO statement had a reference to structures being built by China across the LAC. Now, I'm a little intrigued by those three words, across the LAC. What does that mean? Does it mean that there were structures being constructed by the Chinese on our side of the LAC? Or was it just across the LAC? There's a little ambiguity in that drafting. I don't know if it was shown to the Ministry of External Affairs, which had all along been very categorical that an intrusion had occurred. Mrs. Rao, the ambiguity is much greater than just those references to whether across or on our side of the LAC. The ambiguity emerges from the first half of that statement, which, as I keep repeating, the PMO cleverly edited out the next day. Na koi waha hamari seema mein ghusaya hai. That clearly in English means that no one has intruded across our border. Now, it's that that has created consternation. And I want to put to you the implications of that statement in terms of Galwan and separately in terms of Pangong Lake. Let's start with Galwan. As you know, on the 15th night at Galwan, 20 Indian soldiers were killed by the Chinese and some 10 more were taken into Chinese custody. But we've always believed in India that Galwan is one area where the LAC is not in dispute. Galwan is India. However, after the clash, the Chinese on two separate occasions said that Galwan is and always has been Chinese. So then when the prime minister says no one has intruded across our border, is he not in a way seeming to agree with the Chinese that Galwan is Chinese? Well, I completely concede the fact that the statement has created a lot of speculation as to what 
uh, was going on in the prime minister's mind when he made that statement so that is something that we will have to analyze in much more depth but let me say when you uh, make the statement that uh, nobody has intruded into our territory you're essentially saying that um, all the um, you know there is an implication here which i think the government needs to weigh very carefully also because china is and we have always maintained this that china is in occupation of 38000 square kilometers of what we regard as indian territory in the aksai chin and in southeastern ladakh so uh, where will where does the statement point to i mean what is the direction we are taking so these implications also have to be weighed for instance take pangong so everybody is talking okay, about let's, let's stop i'll come to pangong in a moment's time let's first exhaust the implications for galwan and you're absolutely right that the prime minister's statement that no one has intruded ignores the fact that china has been in occupation as you put it of 28000 square kilometers of indian territory 38000 38000 Square kilometers of Indian territory in Ladakh, as well as in, uh, Aks- uh, sorry, forgive me, uh, Arunachal Pradesh. No, Aksai, Chin. Aksai, Chin. Aksai Chin. Let me different. The the lapse made by the Prime Minister when he said, "Na koi waha hamari sima me kus aya hai," seems to have been compounded a day later by the spokesman of the Ministry of External Affairs when he was asked how he comments on the claim China has made. that galwan is chinese he sp- said that the situation was historically clear he said china's claims were exaggerated and untenable he said they did not accord with the position china itself had taken in the past but at no point of time did mr shrivastav say galwan is indian those are three simple words galwan is indian he never said it and don't you find that odd well you have to ask the spokesperson to clarify that i don't want to comment further but all this i think points to uh, one essential bottom line that the government's communication uh, obviously has to be much more uh, precise and uh, less ambiguous because unfortunately what has happened is as you mentioned uh, the chinese uh, the chinese mainstream media and obviously coached by their establishment you know the way uh, the situation uh, is configured on the chinese side they have obviously taken this and run with it so i think uh, there is need for us to clarify matters so that this confusion and this ambiguity is not further compounded i completely agree that even now there is need to clarify matters and remember there have already been two clarifications of what the pm said on friday first by the pmo and then a little later by the ministry of external affairs but the statement made in the context of galwan also puts the indian soldiers who were killed and remember there were 20 of them and 10 more were taken into chinese custody it also raises question marks about them it seems to suggest that they were killed or taken into custody on chinese territory and that in a sense gives china some sort of justification for what it did i think that is why the pmo has to clarify uh, those three words across the lac uh, i mean having been in the practice of diplomacy for uh, for a considerable time for many decades i know that every word we choose when we make a statement which is in the public domain is weighed very very carefully we kind of masticate those words before we throw them out into the public domain in order to ensure that there is no doubt no ambiguity no confusion created as a result of what we say what we've seen in the last few days is a compounding of that confusion unfortunately for the country and i speak as a citizen not not as somebody who's trying to pick holes in what the government is saying i'm concerned about it because our national interest is involved let me go now to the pangong lake situation and ask you about the ramifications of the prime minister's friday statement with regard to pangong lake once again i'll remind the audience of the critical bit of the pm statement he said na koi waha hamari seema mein ghus aaya hai which in english means 
No one has intruded across our border. Now, in Pangong Lake, the Chinese have built pretty massive defensive structures. According to the Economic Times, they've even built a marina that is denying India access to some 50 square kilometers where previously we would easily patrol. I accept that Pangong Lake is an area which is disputed by both parties, but India does firmly believe that the area between Finger 4 and Finger 8 is India. So when the Prime Minister says no one intruded, once again he gives the impression that perhaps he's giving up India's claim to the area between Finger 4 and Finger 8. Well, first of all, let me go back to the occupation by China of our territory. I want you to get also our viewers to get the figures correctly. Now, in Aksai Chin and in southern Ladakh, the area under occupation by China is 38,000 square kilometers. I'm not talking of Arunachal Pradesh, where the Chinese claim 90,000 square kilometers of our territory, but are not in occupation of that claim. So that's the difference. And in Pakistan occupied Kashmir, of course, there was a separate so-called agreement between China and Pakistan, where uh, more than 5,000 square kilometers of Indian territory was handed over to China in early 1963. So let me put that in context. That's when the Shaksgam Valley, isn't it? Exactly. It's the Shaksgam Valley. Uh, but Valley. Shaksgam come now to Pangong, because the critical question is that when the Prime Minister says no one has intruded, and in this instance, even the second half of his statement applies, no one is intruding, means to suggest that he's ignoring the fact that the Chinese have built fairly massive defensive structures between fingers four and eight, are denying India the right to patrol in what we believe is our territory. And in this instance, both halves of his statement apply, that no one has intruded, and no one is intruding. The Chinese are presently, even as we speak, intruding. But that again, the Prime Minister has overlooked or forgotten. No, Karan, I think we need to calm it a little here. I don't think the Prime Minister was referring to Pangong So. I mean, to the best of my knowledge, he was not referring to Pangong So. He was referring to the situation in the Galvan Valley. Now, in the case of Pangong So, there are, there's a very interesting, um, you know, uh, sequence that we have to keep in mind. Do you remember the Battle of Sirijap in 1962 and the story of Major Dhan Singh Thapa, who won the Parambit Chakra, uh, who was, in fact, believed dead but taken into custody by the Chinese and released later? That was a kind of miracle of sorts. So, Sirijap, where the battle was fought and where our, the soldiers laid down their lives in one of the epic battles of this 1962 in the western sector, is about 15 kilometers to the east of where we are now. So you see where the LAC is moving. The LAC in 1962 was in Sirijap. The LAC today, as you said, is between finger four and finger eight. I mean, we were up to finger eight and they've come in up to finger four. It's, uh, you know, so the Chinese have advanced much further. So this is the, the uh, development that we have to scrutinize very closely. Absolutely. You're very right in pointing out that progressively since 1962, the Chinese have been advancing the LAC to their benefit and it's been pushed back to our disadvantage. You may be right. That when the Prime Minister made his statement on Friday, he was only talking about Galwan, not Pangong Lake. Although, let's be honest, the Prime Minister did not make that distinction on Friday himself. That was made on his behalf by the PMO later. When the Prime Minister spoke on Friday, it seemed to the country that he was talking about everything that was happening, not just a specific part of it. But let's not quarrel over that. The Prime Minister has to clarify what he meant and by not clarifying immediately or by putting out clarifications that need further clarification, as you yourself pointed out, the situation is getting worse. Let's come to something you referred to a moment ago, the way the Chinese have picked up the Prime Minister's statement. As you know, Mandarin translations of it are circulating on the Chinese social media. The editor of the Global Times has tweeted, and I quote, PM Modi said that China didn't intrude into Indian territory. And then he adds, Indian society must dare to face up to this basic fact. It is Indian troops that provoked the deadly clash. Clearly, the Chinese are using the PM's words to actually prove to themselves and the world that India is in the wrong and that they have made no error. 
Well, you could hardly expect the Chinese to say anything else. I mean, it's their megaphone diplomacy. It's their propaganda machinery going into overdrive. I don't want to say uh, anything further about what the Chinese say. They always say this. I mean, you look at the white papers on the India-China boundary dispute. Uh, was there any one occasion where the Chinese didn't accuse us of crossing over into their territory? So that's all part of a pattern. It's Absolutely. very, very typical of the Chinese. There is no doubt that the Chinese have a propaganda machine, but in this instance, the sad part is the machine has been fed by a statement made by the Prime Minister. And I want to now quote to you what the Global Times in an editorial yesterday, Sunday said. I'm quoting, Modi is trying to respond to the nationalists and hardliners with tough talk. But, the paper adds, and this is critical, he understands his country cannot have further conflict with China, so he is also making an effort to cool tensions. This interpretation by the Global Times in yesterday's editorial clearly suggests that they believe the Prime Minister has deliberately spoken, deliberately said no one included, so that tensions cool down, there is no political pressure on him to retaliate, and therefore we avoid any of the consequences of retaliation. That is now the interpretation the Global Times is giving it. I think it's very important for the government to keep the interests of the nation in mind. And I, I would subscribe to the view that tensions need to cool and the government must take steps to kind of contain the emotional hysteria that you're seeing in some quarters, which uh, really to me is so self-defeating. Why are we going after Chinese food and throwing Chinese television sets down buildings? I mean, it, sh it shows us as uh, people who have, uh, who, you know, it's very easy to trigger off an emotional hysteria in us. The second point is that most people in the country, India is completely or almost completely devoid of um, of experts on China, people who have studied the history of this dispute, people who know the kind of steps and missteps and calculations and miscalculations that were done in the run up to 1962. I would exhort people and I would exhort also our government to formulate policies that enable that kind of expertise in the country to be fostered. There is, you know, we need to be, we, I, we need to be patriotic. But we also need to be expert. Can I put the opposite of the line of questioning I've taken so far about the PM statement? Is there a sense in which what the Global Times is hinting at may be actually the truth? That the Prime Minister knowingly and deliberately said no one has included so that you diminish the pressure and tension on him from the Indian side. So that his hand is not forced into retaliation because he perhaps in his mind knows the retaliation would lead to conflict and we don't know what would be the outcome of a conflict and certainly at a time of COVID and an economy collapsing, we don't want a conflict either. So do you think the Global Times might actually be right that the Prime Minister used that phrase deliberately, it then became contentious and he had to of course clarify what he meant and it got him into confusion. But initially it might have been, it might have been his intention to dial down tension. Well, I... I don't think the Global Times can be some kind of shaman as far as reading our intentions are concerned. So I don't want to uh, accord to the Global Times an importance that it hardly deserves. But if it means, if the Prime Minister meant that we need to damp down tensions, let's be calm, uh, let's be well considered in the steps that we take, I think that's, that's, uh, that's sensible, that's common sense oriented. The second point is that, you know, the government today, the NDA government enjoys this huge majority in the Lok Sabha and of course I believe in the Rajya Sabha also as a result of the recent elections. It has a very comfortable position. We should be looking at how we can arrive at a border settlement with China. I'm not saying, I mean, reading Yun Sun's uh, uh, article in The War on Rocks, uh, it would suggest that the Chinese couldn't care about a border settlement. They just want to string us along. They want to increase tension along the line of actual control. They want to make us squirm. That could be a possible theoretical explanation. But from our side, uh, we want 
to be seen as people who take a mature view of these developments. Something happened in Galwan. We need to understand how things went so terribly wrong. But we also know that conflict cannot be a, a I, rational solution. I, I come to the way in which we handle the border dispute right across from Ladakh to Arunachal a little later. But let me put you something else that I suppose the PMO and the MEA are worried about. In Ladakh and Sikkim, we witnessed an assertive China seeking to fully control areas that up till now it's only laid claim to. Are there chances that this could also become Chinese strategy in Arunachal Pradesh and even in the central sector? That in other words, what we see in Ladakh could happen elsewhere too. China insisting that it will control fully areas that so far it's only laid claim to. Well, I really can't say how the People's Liberation Army and their forces in Tibet and the command structure you know, you have General Chang Chung Chi, who is the commander of the Western Theater Command of the PLA, uh, just across our LAC and our borders. Uh, he is a, he's a veteran of Tibetan affairs, military affairs, and uh, he's uh, apparently some China watchers say he's already a member of the Central Committee of the party, and he is uh, trying, uh, some China watchers say, to see how he can somehow uh, fulfill his aspirations to be a part of the Central Military Commission. We don't know what direction that will take, but you're dealing with a PLA across the LAC that has memories of the 1962 conflict. And do you know some of them, there is a, some, uh, some of the retired people even say that China lost the war with India, that they were not the real victors of the war. The real victors were the Indians because China was, uh, of course, had, was, uh, occupies our territory in Aksai Chin. But in Arunachal Pradesh, they came in and they withdrew. They withdrew from the area of the most important claim for them. I, I, I'm stopping you there. What you're suggesting is there could be elements in the PLA, some very senior elements like the general you cited, who for reasons of personal ambition may actually be adventurous. And what we've seen in the dark and sickening, China insisting upon full control of the area up to now, which it has only claimed, could be replicated elsewhere as well. Let me then put this to you. At the moment, the Indian approach is that negotiation at whatever level will lead to the status quo being restored. We want status quo ante restored. But is that likely? When China now is taking the position that Galwan is and always has been Chinese, when China has built these massive defensive structures, including, according to the Economic Times, a whole marina in Pangong Lake, will they retreat and disengage? Will they not now say, this is ours, we are staying here? Clearly, negotiations can't produce the outcome we want. You know, we need now to detach ourselves and take a slightly larger view of what uh, what are the sources of Chinese conduct and what their intentions may be. I agree with you, you're dealing with a very adventurous, a very assertive and very aggressive China today. And there's uh, they are not hiding their light under a bushel anymore. Uh, they are, uh, they want to, the new mantra is uh, striving for achievement. Now, if you were a PLA officer, what would that achievement be? The achievement would be that we have safeguarded what is China's territory. We've thrown out intruders, I'm putting that in inverted commas, and that um, we will not cede an inch uh, to India and India cannot be trusted. That is the kind of, uh, you know, spiel that is going around uh, the Chinese opinion makers, it seems. So there's a complete breakdown of trust between the two countries. There never was much trust to begin with, but it has broken down after Galwan. So the government needs to take a very, very clear call on what the direction of our China policy should be. Because but, 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 but before, we come, before we come to the direction of China policy, let's finish discussing the problem that we face at the moment. If, as you're suggesting, the Chinese position is increasingly becoming, we have thrown the intruders out, we will not concede an inch. That also suggests that negotiations will not secure status quo ante as we want. If that is the case, then would you agree that India is simply left with two other possibilities? Either we take military action to push the Chinese back, and that, of course, would entail conflict, or we accept the fate of conflict. There's no third alternative. Karan, 
and I think it's a very dark hour uh, for us. And the Galwan incident, in my uh, opinion, is a very great blow also to our prestige, especially in the neighborhood. So uh, we have to think through this very carefully. Obviously, conflict is not the answer. Obviously, we have to keep the diplomatic channels open. But, um, you know, uh, what happened in Galwan and the position our government has been placed in as a result, uh, you know, I, I, I am, you know, I grieve. I really grieve for India at this moment. I really do. You know, you mentioned that this is a great blow to our prestige in the neighborhood. I imagine what you have at the back of your mind is that in the eyes of our neighboring countries, we no longer look like the regional leader of South Asia. We look like just another country, not quite able to handle China and a little nervous about what China might do if we stand up. Is that at the back of your mind? That's a sense in which our prestige has been lost. No, and that's why I think uh, we need to reach out to our neighbors and correct any such impressions that have been formed. And I think we need, uh, uh, look, with Nepal, for instance, uh, we haven't been able to really talk to them after this whole controversy about the new maps and the uh, parliamentary discussion, the constitutional amendment, all that has taken place. Uh, where is that policy? Uh, there is ample scope for us to be seen as a little more generous, a little more giving uh, when it comes to our smaller neighbors. Why is it that we our neighborhood policy lies in such a shambles, is my question. That's and, a very good point. And there is Pakistan too. I mean, do we want two fronts? Two antagonistic fronts. I mean, we can, we can of course, uh, shout at the rooftops that we are capable of taking on both these countries. But let's take a reality check. And I think there is scope, you know, with Pakistan at least, uh, which is a neighbor which was partitioned out of India. You know, the kind of um, connections, despite the disconnections that we have with Pakistan, are, you know, uh, something that we should uh, understand and be able to use and leverage in a way that reopens the channels for some degree of communication with Pakistan. We can't, you know, have um, Balakot on one front and Galwan on the other and more to come. I think uh, let's, let's be realistic. You know, you're saying very clearly almost that we need to open channels of communication. We need to reactivate the old connections which are historical and cultural, they go back to generations, decades and centuries. But isn't that a little problem now? Won't China, sorry, won't Pakistan be emboldened by what China has done? And won't Pakistan feel that they can stand up a bit more to India and be a little less cowed by India? Quite possible, quite possible. So we have to, I think, also as we dissect what happened with China, try and dissect also what went wrong in our Pakistan policy. Of course, it's true that Pakistan is a purveyor of terrorism. You know, we've equated Pakistan with terrorism, with terrorist organizations, with Islamic radicalization. But, you know, the uh, in in medical terms, you know, these uh, we, we may and we may assume that there are very strong barriers, a blood brain barrier between India and Pakistan. We can never uh, be touched by all these events, we will just be strong and unyielding vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan. But that is not the way it's, it works. You know, you have China on one front, you have Pakistan on the other, you have trouble brewing in Nepal. Uh, many of our smaller neighbors are quite capable of playing mischief vis-a-vis -vis India. They may not do anything more than that, knowing that India has a certain weight and leverage in, in the region. But there's a lot that we have to do on these diplomatic fronts. And also, what is our policy going to be in terms of external balancing vis-a-vis -vis China? Absolutely. This is a moment for us to not just think about the future of the relationship with China, but also our relationship with our neighbors. And as you emphasized in particular, our relationship with Pakistan, where you said we need to open up channels of communication. We need to activate the old connections, which are cultural, historical, and go back not just generations, but centuries. Let's take a break at that point. In the limited time left for part two, I want to talk to you about India-China relations. Do we need to fundamentally rethink our relationship with Beijing and what would that entail? We'll be back in a moment's time. 
But first, a little break. Welcome back to a special interview for The Wire. My guest is India's former ambassador to China and former foreign secretary, Nirupama Rao. Mrs. Rao, clearly, as you said to me in an interview just four days ago on Thursday, this is a turning point in the relationship. You also said that the aggressiveness and assertiveness that China is showing in Ladakh is in a sense parallel by its behavior in the South China Sea, with Hong Kong, with Taiwan, with Australia, with America. So let me start this part by asking you, how should we meet this challenge? I think we have to look beyond just the bilateral relationship with China. Obviously, uh, that relationship and the kind of model and modus vivendi we had built for that relationship has, in a sense, uh, become very fundamentally weaker. That is the first point that we have to keep in mind. The second point is, how are we to pick up the pieces from Galwan? How are we to keep a diplomatic channel open with China so that we are able to diffuse this current situation? I don't think the government can turn its back on uh, engagement with China in this regard. So uh, complete disengagement cannot be the answer. You may think of disengaging or a beginning of disengagement in other areas, and that's the second point, in trade, in economy, in functional cooperation in a number of areas, and in the leadership level dialogue that we have. But I would like to say that even after 1962, those channels were open. We withdrew the ambassadors in both countries, but there was a channel open up for communication between the two countries. So we can't close the door on China. That can is I you seem to suggest in that answer that we can, maybe we should reduce trade and also leadership contacts. No, no, I'm not, I'm not saying that. Those are the possibilities that people are talking about, and I don't know what ultimately will happen. But even there, let me continue, there's a coda to what I said. Even there, when it comes to, you know, uh, going at trade and going at economic uh, investment and interaction, let's weigh the pros and cons very carefully. You know, we account for 2% or 3% of Chinese exports on a global uh, in a global framework. And whereas, you know, in terms of our imports, 14% uh, of our imports are from China. There's a lot invested in our manufacturing industries, you know, people who manufacture in terms of supply chains, in terms of investment in our technology startups, for instance. That's considered. So how are we going to um, devise a framework which is able to take into account that there is so much vested in this relationship today and how are we going to create a new framework where there will be less of such interest being vested. In fact, what you're saying is that the calls that we're hearing to stop trading with China are more knee-jerk and emotional rather than well thought out because in a very real sense, Indian consumers, Indian manufacturers will suffer so many of our supply chains actually stretch back to Beijing. Replacing them would be very difficult. So there is a need to separate between emotion and knee-jerk response and actually wise strategy. And your answer is, please think carefully before you start trade boycotts or you start rejecting Chinese investment. Absolutely. And then the third point I wanted to make is the larger a regional and global situation. I already spoke about what we might do in the, in the neighborhood, but in the larger Indo-Pacific framework, in the context of our relations with the United States, which is a strategic partner, uh, a defense partner, I mean, the kind of improvements we've seen in that relationship are impressive, to say the least, and, and that is something that is a strategic asset to us today. But we have to also, in a sense, use that asset in a very uh, well thought out manner that so that we are able to integrate that asset with our larger interests in the Indo-Pacific, our relations with but Japan I and Australia, Vietnam. I that there are diplomatic options available to us that emerge out of the fact that we have good relations 
with countries like America, Australia, Japan. China at the moment has serious problems with those. And are you suggesting that we could leverage these to our advantage? I definitely agree that we have leverage and we should be able to utilize that to our strategic advantage, that we have to move in a calculated way. We've been a little hesitant, I think, in the past about uh, being more vocal about these interests and uh, siding a little more or aligning ourselves a little more closely with these countries. Uh, strategic autonomy can also involve the decisions we take in this regard, where if we decide to get closer to the United States or to the other democracies and partners in the region, why not? And I don't think it dilutes our strategic autonomy in any way because we've you're, kept you're, the... Which I that the reticence we earlier felt because we didn't want to upset and offend Beijing should no longer be a factor of consideration in our mind. Exactly. I don't think we need to look over our shoulders and be uh, too uh, concerned about what the Chinese reactions can be. I think we've, uh, you know, the face that China has shown to us in the last few days is unpleasant, it's unfriendly, it's hostile. And we have every right, therefore, to take steps that respond to that situation in multifold ways. My last question. Is this a moment when perhaps we should also think carefully of our relationship with Taiwan? Perhaps be more accommodating of Taiwan's desire to be a fuller member of WHO? Is this a moment when perhaps we should come out in support of the democracy movement in Hong Kong rather than maintain studious silence? I mean, those are all things that we could do as a way of suggesting to China, please, we also have a few cards in our hands. Or might that be unwise? Because China could equally stir up trouble in our northeast. I think our one China policy stands, and I don't think we should deviate from that. So that's my answer to Taiwan. But with there, there's no uh, reason why we should not develop f more ties with Taiwan. We have a representative, representative office in Taipei, and uh, they have a representative office uh, in our offices in our country. So. Um, I think in terms of trade and economic uh, contact, in terms of people-to-people -people ties, uh, you know, two of our BJP MPs, I think, attended the virtual swearing-in of the new president of Taiwan. Why not? I think that was, that was a good step to take. So to, regardless of the Chinese um, fulminating about what we are doing with Taiwan, I think we need to be a little, we can afford to be a little bolder. What about Taiwan? Hong Kong? Where in democracy, should we not be outspoken in support of the democracy movement rather than silent? I think in concert with our other partners in the region, we should develop a policy towards Hong Kong. I think this is more a consultative route that we need to take. Yes, we are a democracy and obviously we support the fundam fundamental freedoms that you know the demonstrators in Hong Kong are seeking to obtain for themselves. Uh, but But... Uh, we have to, I think, in concert with our other friends and neighbors, uh, decide what kind of approach we need to take. Because this is not a problem that is going to go away easily, what is happening in Hong Kong with the extension of the national security law. So, so in a nutshell, and I'm summing up what you're suggesting, is some of the reticence we've shown, because we didn't want to upset and offend Beijing, should now be dropped. And some of the principles that are inherent in our constitution, like democracy and free speech, are issues on which we, our voice should be heard more openly. And as you say, in concert with our partners, we should be more supportive of Hong Kong. In other words, we should also be more assertive, less worried about Beijing's response, and more willing at times to challenge Beijing in concert with others. Uh, so I think the first point I'd like to make, Karan, in response to what you said, is that we need have no illusions about China. China has shown its true face to us in Galwan. So that's the first point. Have no illusions and calibrate your responses accordingly. That's number one. Number two is that internally within the country, you know, given the state of the economy, given the COVID-19 crisis, uh, 
you know, there are many, many challenges that we face and whatever steps we take vis-a-vis -vis China should keep in mind those challenges so that we are not left uh, choosing between, you know, a, a rock and, a, and another rock, as it were. Okay. So, I, yeah, that's the, and the th third point is our larger regional and global balancing. Uh, we need to take a close look at that and to see, as, as you said, and as I said earlier, that we are less hesitant less, uh, you know, sensitive about what the Chinese may think. In any case, they seem to be most insecure. You know, if they can suggest that we are taking advantage of their vulnerabilities after COVID-19, okay. COVID you know exactly where they're coming from. They just, I don't think they have the power to lead the world. Really, they don't. We're going to have to leave it there, Mrs. Rao. That was a very comprehensive interview. Um, one that covers not just your interpretation of what the Prime Minister said and its implications, but one which also talks about the way we need to fundamentally rethink our relationship with China. And the important point there is we need to be less sensitive about China's feelings and more assertive about our interests and our own principles. Thank you very much for speaking to me. Take care and stay safe. Thank you, Karan. Always a pleasure. To receive instant updates on all videos from The Wire, click the subscribe button and hit the bell icon. Pay to support independent journalism. Click the link in the description and choose the amount you want to pay.